for a center, either 930 to 12 or 2 to 4. Uh, volunteers are always needed to help bag up the grocery items and place them in vehicles. Uh, so um, S Susan uh, Mullis, uh, you know, uh, sent word yesterday she didn't quite think she'd be able to make it this time. Um, uh, but uh, I'm thankful she's in good spirits um, and that, but uh, we will be shorthanded to tomorrow a little bit, so if you are free and would like to come help, that would be wonderful. Uh, also, uh, take note, deacons, tomorrow night at 7 is deacons meeting. Uh, you can either choose to come and attend in person, or uh, if you would love, prefer to Zoom in, uh, just let me know and I will give you the information uh, for that. I, I will be glad to set up a Zoom meeting uh, for that as well. Um, next Sunday, August 16th, we will observe the service of the Lord's Supper. Jim, I forgot to tell you that. You might want to make note of that. Um, we might want to change the service a little bit, but I hope that um, y'all will come. And if you are watching at home and uh, right now and would like to participate, if you would like to come by the church this week and pick up supplies to do communion at home with us next week, uh, that would be wonderful. We ordered uh, individually wrapped um, servings of communion supplies uh, so that we may be able to uh, conduct communion as safely uh, as possible. And it's been a while since we've had communion, so I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, thank you for your attention to all of these matters. Thank you, Beth and Wanda, for setting the mood for our beginning of our service. May we stand as we sing together. We are called to be God's people.
do you guys like to receive gifts? Yeah, like at Christmas time or your birthdays? Yeah. Uh, it's great to get to receive a gift, either it's on those special occasions or just because, right? So our lesson today is of a verse that teaches us about the ki- about kinds of gifts. It's in 1 Peter, which is in the New Testament, 4.10, and it says this. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So this is talking about the gifts that God gives us. And these gifts might be a little different than a package we would open up and receive. These gifts are talking about gifts that we have, like being able to sing music or being able to serve others. And what this verse is saying is that we need to be able to use that gift to be able to teach others about God. And so it might take a little bit to learn what gift you have. So this week, what I want y'all to do is to ask your family members what gifts they see in you and then to be able to use those gifts you have, right? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for giving each of us special gifts. In your name we pray, amen. I think it's a little too early to tell, but if I had to guess, I think Beckett's a mischief looking for a place to happen. <laughs> Let us uh, stand for our next hymn, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian.
pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today with, with uh, joyful hearts that you are showing your, your healing powers and mercies to one of our members who was involved in an accident last weekend. I uh, know that, that Susan and Steve are having a hard time, but uh, they're going to make it. We come together today to, to bring blessings and offerings for you uh, so that we are showing you that, that uh, we understand that it takes uh, more than just good wishes to uh, run this church. Uh, hopefully the word, the money that we receive will be used to the betterment of our local community. We ask these things in thy name. Amen. Stand together, please, for our doxology.
and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly Our scripture for this morning is one of some length, but it is a powerful passage from 1 Peter. We'll be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 uh, through the 12th verse of chapter 2. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke as Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That word is the good news that was announced to you. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile and sincerity, envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourself be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, 
See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who don't believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a royal holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. You know, home makeover reality TV shows have been quite the rage for a while now. It's a huge genre of TV shows, so much so I tried to count the number of shows on air right now that deal with home renovations and all that. I lost track after like two dozen. I was like, it's ridiculous. There's at least two cable channels dedicated solely to that topic. I doubt there's anyone in this room watching a home or heck, probably even in the country that don't know who Chip and Joanna Gaines are at this point. But in these shows, what happens is they usually take a home, one that's usually tired and worn out, bordering on totally dilapidated, and they flip it. The crews go in, they remove everything that needs to go, and clear everything out anew, like artists preparing their uh, canvas, and once all the old is removed, that's when they come in with the new. When these artists truly get to create their masterpiece, and painstakingly these renovations, they take shape, and before long it's pretty much impossible to tell what these homes look like before they started. Because that which was old is all of a sudden new again. And I believe that's the appeal of these shows. That before and after effect is so dramatic. But I think there's something in our spirit that resonates with the idea that the way something is or was isn't what it always has to be. And of course in a good number of these shows they, they're flipping the house with the hopes of making a profit. The, the renovators have bought the house with the purpose of renovating it, making it, renewing it, and selling it. So at the end of some of these shows, they tell you, this is what the house was worth beforehand, this is what it sold for afterwards, and it's usually buku's of money in, in the difference. Now suppose that the original owner of one of these homes before the renovation came along and said, you know what? I love what you've done with the place. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll give you back what you paid for it. Can I have it back? How do you think that'd go over? Yeah, exactly. They'd be laughed out of the room. Such a proposition would be insulting. Because the renovators put in a lot of hard work to make these places new. They bring new life to something that desperately needs it. Why in the world then would they be willing to settle for less? They wouldn't because they know what they have and what it took to make that renovation a reality. The good news of the gospel is that we are like one of these renovated homes. The emphasis in the passage is that we are a people who have been bought or ransomed with a price. 
We, humankind, were created good. You can flip back to Genesis and see God created and pronounced it good. But as, as typical with humankind, it didn't take long for us to get that off track. The human condition quickly deteriorated into something less than God had intended it to be. Each one of us is subject to the dilapidation that sin causes in life. Finding ourselves used for all kinds of purposes other than what God intended. No matter how much or hard we try on our own, we can't restore ourselves to that original luster. But God, being the compassionate, merciful God that God is, looked down upon us and said, No, it will not be this way. I will not leave them run down in the shape that they're in, but instead I will change them. I will renew them. I will renovate them. Not for the purpose of selling us, but for keeping us as God's own. Restoring and increasing our value as God's own children through Jesus Christ. So that we again might be used for our intended purpose. Loving God and loving others. To make the point of what this renovation was worth, Peter draws upon the image of sacrifice. Both the Old Testament sacrifice of Passover as Israel was freed from slavery and the sacrifice of Jesus. Peter reminds us that in this renovation there has been a steep price paid to make it happen. God gave God's self as that price, gave it willingly for us. So then Peter's point is this. You're special. You are important to God. You are valuable. Stop selling yourself short. Remember who you are and what you're worth. The redemption of us. To make us the vessels upon which God inhabits this world was always God's plan. God always had a purpose for us. It's us that have sold ourselves short. God has never done that, nor will God ever sell us short because God doesn't give up on us. It's through God's redemptive restoration and renovation that we can be who we were created to be. That's why Peter tells us that we have to live our lives in ways that are revolutionary in light of what so many consider to be quote-unquote normal. We are the home that was in shabby, run-down condition and Jesus came in and changed all that. We were one thing, but in Christ we are now something else. Remember who you are. We can't let anything else claim ownership of our lives. Especially anything that undervalues us as being in Christ. We stand renewed and must not let anyone or anything drag us back into any kind of state of decay. We've been renovated to be the presence of Christ in our world. And with that comes this calling to live up to who it is that we are. A people who have been chosen and set apart by God for a purpose. When we remember who we are, it shapes how we view everything. It shapes how we think about the past. It shapes how we think about the future. It shapes what we think and do right here in the present. God's been in this redemptive renovation business for a long time and will continue to do so. And we are just part of God flipping the world right now for the better. That's who we are. And the calling for us is to never forget that. To allow God to use us for 
what we were designed for. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. That's what it means to let Him be our Messiah, our Savior. To let Him be the authority in our life. To have faith and hope in God is to remember who we are, the redeemed of God. And it's impossible to remember who we are without remembering to whom we belong. To convey that, we switch images from a home renovation to that of a baby. You know, babies know who he or she belongs to. From the very time they're born, an infant's identity, their very existence is tied to their parents. It's their interaction with their parents, particularly particularly their mother, that their identity begins to form. In fact, relationship with parents is the number one influence on identity development. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that that little dude right there, he's becoming more self-aware by the day, but one thing he knows for sure is that he is that mama's boy. And Lord, it's been a struggle this week. So we've gone back to the babysitters. He's wanted nothing to do with her. In fact, he's gone on a hunger strike. But why? Why do kids do that? Because there's anxiety there when what one's identity and life has been centered around is missing. We call it mommy withdrawal in our house, but we, according to Peter, are just like that. Who we are and who God is, those are intertwined. We as the child, God as the parent, our identities are woven together. The more we know about the nature of Christ, the more we know about ourselves. And when we are away from God, we are more anxious and less secure in who we are. As a baby is nourished and grows, it of course grows into a child, a teen, an adult. Along the way, becoming more aware of who they are, who their family is, interacting with their peers. So it is in our relationship with Christ. As we mature in Christ, we too learn more about ourselves. We learn more about the God to whom we belong and how we are called to interact with others. We grow and develop and change and become more aware, or at least we should, of who we are. You can look at kids and you can kind of see that evolution of self-awareness. Kids at, at Beckett's age and younger are extremely selfish. It's a survival mechanism. I want what I want when I want it right now. I need it. But of course the idea is, as they get older, you become a little less selfish. You learn things like sharing, right Lily? Yep, oblivious. Her personality. But as we mature, we're called to put away those selfish feelings and learn to interact with others in ways that are filled with compassion and love and care, respect, And if that doesn't happen, those selfish impulses that keep us alive when we're teeny tiny quickly become something more sinister. They turn into deceit and hatred. Narcissistic tendencies. Evil words and attitudes. And it makes it hard to embrace the way of sincere love. But if in our relationship with Christ, we pursue Christ and come to know who He is, then we come to know more about ourselves. That in Christ, we are indeed capable of more love in our heart, more holy in our heart. 
We are capable of reflecting Jesus more and more in who we are. As we embrace the way of sincere love. That's the challenge that Peter is calling his readers to live up to. To step up to the challenge of remembering who they are in Christ and being those people. To know who they are. To know who we are for you and I. To know that we are God's. And reflect that in our lives. You know, we talk a lot about peer pressure with kids and teens. But as adults, I don't think we think about it all that much. We think by the time we're adults, we got it all figured out. Peer pressure, what's that? But you know, there's a whole lot of voices in our world today clamoring for our attention. A whole lot of voices out there telling us, you belong to our tribe, you're one of our people, you need to do what we want you to do. And along the way, there's even been a whole lot of co-opting of Christian for purposes that have nothing to do with Christ. That's exactly why Peter tells us, you've got to know who you are. If you don't know that, it won't take long before you're lost, confused, and scared, and living in fear. You won't know which way you're going. You won't even know yourself. You'll be gullible, easily fooled. And you won't be able to tell Jesus' way from anything else. He says you've got to remember who you are. You've got to remember who Jesus really is. And to do that, you've got to rely on the Word of God. We hear that phrase, the Word of God, we... Our mind usually goes straight to the Bible, which in itself is not wrong. The Bible indeed is recorded words for our spiritual growth and development to bring us closer to God. But what Peter is referring to is even more than that. In fact, Peter didn't even have access to the Bible as we know it. How are you going to have access to something you're part of writing? But the word of God is referred to here, refers to Jesus himself. The man, the message, the savior, the spirit, the word and flesh and blood and bone and soul. The word of the Lord, the word of God goes beyond words. The word is the very living spirit of Christ working in and through us. And when we are receptive to that word, it comes in, it yanks out all the old, shapes, molds, forms the new, and puts it into place and renovates us into something new. What we were isn't what we always have to be. When we rely upon the living word, then and only then do we recognize and remember who we really are. Words on a page can be manipulated and misunderstood. But the living word speaks loudly and clearly if we're paying attention. Let's turn our attention back one more time to this image of a renovated home. In those renovations, before anything else happens, the the foundation and the, the bones, the structure of the home are checked for any problems because those have to be fixed before you do anything else. If your foundation isn't solid, there's no point in proceeding. Peter turns to this image of Jesus as the stone upon which we are to be built. He says, remember, remember you were once a people whose foundation and bones were shaky, unstable. But when Jesus comes in, everything is rebuilt from the ground up. You aren't merely a home with a fresh coat of paint thrown on it. You might as well put lipstick on a pig. But instead, you are the living stone. You have been built upon the living stone from the ground up. The transformation that Jesus has made in our life is not just surface deep. And that's extremely important in remembering who we are. What Peter tells us right here is critical for our life and faith. 
We are a people who are a house for Christ to dwell in this world. A house built upon Jesus for Jesus. And we aren't the only one. There's millions of us around the world. Collectively, these homes for God are placed in every neighborhood. As Peter puts it, we are the temple in which the Spirit of God resides. Knowing who we are reminds us that we're part of a collective unit, a community. Who are we? We're a people with an enormous responsibility and privilege. A people who have been renovated from the inside out, from the top to the bottom by the power of Christ. Only by remembering who we are and who we belong to can we step up to the challenge of living into that reality. The reality of living as a people who stand out. To be the house in the neighborhood that is different. To be the one that is renewed when the world is in a state of decay. To be the newly reconditioned, hope-filled, love-giving, faith-sharing people of God. Let us step up to the challenge and remember who we are. Please stand for our hymn of response, I am thine, O Lord. <clears throat> Gracious God, thank you for claiming <clears throat> us as your own. Thank you for changing us for the better, for restoring our souls, renovating our lives. Lord, help us to remember who we are, a new creation in you, so that we might love you, love others, and be your presence in our world. As we go, let us remember who you are. Let us remember who we are. Amen.